That sparked nationwide and even global protests against policing tactics and racial injustice. In April, Chauvin was convicted of second-degree murder, third-degree murder, and second-degree manslaughter. But as we watch events play out today, it's important to note today he will be sentenced for only one of those, the top charge of second-degree murder. Minnesota state guidelines recommend a sentence of between 10 and 15 years, but Judge Peter Cahill could hand down a penalty up to 40 years because of so-called aggravating factors. Among them, Chauvin killed Floyd in front of children, also that he abused his authority as a police officer. Judge Cahill will be taking the bench in the Hennepin County courtroom any moment uh, from now, but right now, let's go to NBC's Gabe Gutierrez, who's been covering this case since the very beginning. Set the scene outside, the difference between now and, and the uh, jury deliberations. Well, certainly, Lester, you can see behind me the road is open. That is extremely different than what we saw just a few months ago, two months ago when this verdict came down. You remember this courthouse was heavily barricaded. There was barbed wire here. There was a tension in this city. That has changed significantly since that verdict of guilty came about uh, two months ago. Now we're waiting. Um, now we are awaiting this sentencing, as I understand Actually, it. Gabe, uh, the I'm judge gonna... is heading into the courtroom. He Back is in the Lester. courtroom. Gabe, thank you. Let's take you there. And for the defense. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Eric Nelson and Amy Voss appearing on behalf of uh, Mr. Chauvin. Thank you. Uh, we are still, uh, for all those attending, under somewhat modified COVID restrictions, so we are asking that everyone keep their masks on unless they are speaking. I'll ask for people who are speaking uh, to come up to the lectern and use the microphones and please to remove your mask so that we can hear you clearly uh, and also to maintain the distances that we have set out in the courtroom. Uh, with that, we'll proceed first with the state. Mr. Blackwell, you may proceed with victim input. Yana, we have four victim impact statements. Uh, we will start uh, with the seven-year-old daughter of uh, George Floyd, uh, Gianna Floyd, who will uh, present hers by video. What do you miss most about your daddy? Well, I ask about him all the time. Mm. And that's kind of it. Yeah. Well, when you ask about him, what are you asking about? Well, I was asking. How did my dad get hurt? Do you wish that he was still here with us? Yeah, but he is. Through his spirit? Yes. Yes. And when you see your daddy again one day, what do you want to do when you see him? I want to play with him. What kind of games do you want to play with him? Um, I want to um, play with him, have fun, go on a plane ride, go, um, and that's it. Yeah. Would you... we, used to, we used to have dinner meal every single night before we went to bed. My, uh, my daddy always used to help me brush my teeth. Oh. Do you miss him helping brush your teeth? Yes. How do you hope that the world remembers him? Well, they help him because um, those mean people did something to him. Yeah. If you could say anything to your daddy right now, what would it be? It would be, I miss you and I love you. All right. Thank you, Gianna. I really appreciate you answering questions today. That was Gianna Floyd. Your Honor, next we'll hear from the nephew of uh, George Floyd, uh, Brandon Williams. Mr. Williams. Brandon Williams, B-R-A-N-D-O-N, 
W I L L I A M S. Thank you. You may proceed. On Monday, May 25th, 2020, George Perry, Floyd, George Perry Floyd Jr. was murdered by Derek Chauvin in a malicious and insidious display of hate and abuse of power. Chauvin killed George. Not only did he kill George, but he also displayed a total lack of consideration for human life as he did so. You saw it, I saw it, and millions of people across this country and the globe witnessed the act of hate. A year and one month later, I stand there before you tasked with the duty of expressing how George's death has impacted me personally and the rest of our family. As I racked my brain and thought about what I could say today, I came to this conclusion. It is humanly impossible for me to stand here and convey or articulate the right words that would capture all that we are feeling and what we have felt over this period. So please bear with me as I attempt the impossible. The sudden murder of George has forever traumatized us. You may see us cry, but the full extent of our pain and trauma will never be seen with the naked eye. The heartbreak and hurt goes far beyond any number of tears we could ever cry. Words simply cannot express the pain, anguish, and suffering that our family and friends have endured since George's murder. It has been truly unimaginable. But not as nearly un un unimaginable as the defendant's decision to take the life of a human being with no regard for the effect it may have on others. Although Chauvin will be sentenced today and spend time in prison, he will have the luxury of seeing his family again, talking to him, and he will likely get to spend time with them upon his release. These are all luxuries that my young cousin Gianna were robbed of when Chauvin made the, the, made the active decision to kill our father. There will be no more birthday parties, no graduations, holiday gatherings, or other family celebrations. The laughter, hugs, guidance, advice, sense of security and those opportunities to simply say I love you are forever gone. They say time heals all, and while I generally believe that saying, it's challenging to do so given these unfathomable set of circumstances. Before I conclude, I must highlight a few things. George's murder, this trial, and everything in between has been tragic and devastating. Our family is forever broken, and one thing we cannot get back is George Floyd. It is the request of my family that the maximum penalty for the crime for which the defendant was convicted be imposed. On behalf of my family, friends, community, and supporters, I wish to express my sincerest gratitude for allowing this opportunity of expression. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Your Honor, first, just for the record, this wonderful lady standing here is a Hennepin County a victim uh, advocate. Um, and Ms. Boswell is well known to the court. Yes, thank you, Judge. And so, Your Honor, we'll next uh, hear from the brother of George Floyd, uh, Mr. Terrence Floyd. And Mr. Floyd, if you could state your full name, spelling each of your names. Yes, Terrence Floyd, that's T E R R. E N C E Floyd F L O Y D. Go ahead. I'm here representing my brother. I'm from New York. On May 25th, 2020. My brother was murdered, everyone knows, by Derek Chauvin. The facts of this case were proven beyond a reasonable doubt, and three guilty verdicts were, have been rendered. This situation has really affected me and my family. Any family member that has went through this, we are part of a fraternity of families. And it's not, it's not one of those, you know, fraternities that you enjoy. 
I just over this last year and and and, and months, I actually talked to a few people and um. I wanted to know from the man himself, why? What were you thinking? What was going through your head when you had your knee on my brother's neck? Why, why when, you, when you knew that he posed no threat anymore, he, had, he was handcuffed, why you didn't at least get up? Why you stayed there? <sighs> A month before my brother was murdered, I was on the phone with him and we had a long conversation and as I looked at I looked at the video of my niece, the last conversation me and my brother had was he wanted to have play dates. He wanted to plan play dates with Gianna and my daughter. And we we, we started setting it up. That can't happen. And I have to my daughter's still young, but I still have to Explain to her because this is history. This 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 is a case everybody knows about. So she's gonna find out, and I'm gonna have to explain that to her. And I I think that's to me harder than even just standing here. That I have to talk to my daughter and tell her, you know, about her niece, about her uncle, about the situation. That's basically reliving it all over again, years down the line. I'm here on behalf of my family, me, on, me, on sorry. Okay, on behalf of me and my family, we seek the mass, maximum penalty. We, we don't want to see no more slaps on the wrists. We, we've been through that already. In, this, in my community, in my culture, we've been through that already. Smacked on the wrist. No, 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 no. Because if it was us, if it was, the roles was reversed, there wouldn't be no case. It would have been open and shut. We'd have been under the jail for murdering somebody. So we asked for that same penalty for Derek Chauvin. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Your Honor, the final victim impact statement for the state will come from George Floyd's uh, brother, Philonis Floyd. And sir, if you could begin by giving us your full name and spell each of your names, and I have permitted you to use your phone because you have notes on it, is that correct? Yes, sir. All right, and you may proceed when you're ready, giving us your full name first. Philonis Floyd, uh, spelled P-H-I-L-O-N-I-S-E, last name Floyd, F-L-O-I-D. And you may proceed. One year ago, May 25th, my brother George was murdered by Derek Chauvin and his co-defendants in broad daylight with a knee to his neck for nine minutes and 29 seconds. I was a trucker and immediately my life changed forever. I began to speak to the world for George from the United Nations, Africa, Canada, 
Japan, and so many other countries. Every day, I have begged for justice to be served, reliving the execution of George, while others begged and pleaded for Officer Chauvin to simply just allow George to take a breath. I haven't had a real nice sleep because of the nightmares I constantly have hearing my brother beg and plead for his life over and over again. Even saying, they going to kill me. Please, officer. Screaming for our mom. I, I have had to sit through each day of Officer Derek Chauvin's trial and watch the video of George dying for hours over and over again. For an entire year, I had to relive George being tortured to death every hour of the day, only taking naps and not knowing what a good night's sleep is anymore. I've been lifting my voice tirelessly every day so that George's death will not be in vain. Honorable Judge Peter Cahill, I thank you for allowing me to share this today. George's life mattered. So my family and I, most of all, my niece, Gianna. My niece, Gianna, she needs closure. I'm asking that you please find it suitable to give Officer Chauvin the maximum sentence possible charge that he has been found guilty for. My family and I have been given a life sentence. We will never be able to get George back. Daddy's our daughter's first love. He would never be able to walk Gianna down the aisle at her wedding, attend those magical moments of her life like a daddy-daughter dance, sweet 16 party, seeing her out for prom graduations, and she would never be able to have any personal memories with her father. With a smirk on his face and children present, Officer Chauvin used excessive force and acted against his training. Chauvin had no regards for human life, George's life. I stand before you today asking you to please help us find closure by giving Chauvin the maximum sentence possible, making sure he does his time consecutively without the possibilities of parole, probation, or getting out early for good behavior. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Frank. Thank you, Your Honor. Here today, of course, for sentencing, gives us an opportunity to speak about um, you know, other matters that I think are involved in sentencing and where we are in the criminal justice system in the processing of this case. As a, as a member of an elected office representing the people of the state of Minnesota, as well as the people of the local community, I want to say a couple of things uh, and first of all, I want to really thank some of the police officers at the Minneapolis Police Department who, under great pressure, great stress, and to some extent at peril to their, their occupations, um, what they've devoted their life to, stuck to their oath and their commitment as police officers to speak openly and honestly about policing and the training that is given and received by police officers. Those officers didn't hide behind a blue wall. They came forward. They told this court and those jurors what they knew about training and responsibility. And I think they deserve recognition and credit for that. I would also like to thank members of the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension. You know, those agents get called in, a uh, great sacrifice to their personal lives. Whenever things happen, they go. They did that here, um, and under really extraordinary circumstances, 
completed a very professional and thorough investigation. Um, you know, conducting interviews is hard enough, but conducting them in the atmosphere of the city following the murder of George Floyd was even more difficult. And they did so, I think, above and beyond the call of duty. And I want to thank them for doing that on behalf of the whole prosecution staff. Your Honor, I want to thank the family, the loved ones, the friends of George Floyd. Um, they have been through so much more than families involved in murder cases. He's right. It is a, it is a, it's a fraternity you don't want to be part of. Um, but they've been through so much more because of the pandemic and because of security, safety precautions that we've had to take. They have been through a lot. At a time when they try to grieve, like everybody does for the loss of someone, they are going through so much more. And I want to thank them, all of them, the family. The court saw a testimony from Philonis Floyd, Courtney Ross. These are people who are trying to deal with their loss, but they have to do it in a very public way and under very trying circumstances through no fault of their own. So I thank them. They have all been models of grace and, uh, and understanding. And uh, it's really remarkable, quite frankly. I'll, uh, I think, come back to them in a, uh, again in a little bit. Your Honor, we have submitted a sentencing brief. Um, I would incorporate that. I guess I would incorporate my comments today into that memo. But I do think there are things that I want to uh, bring out today in my arguments. For hundreds of years, the court had discretion in sentencing. It was the trial court's decision on what a sentence should be. The recognition that the trial court sat through the trial, watched the evidence, and saw how it affected people, informed the court's discretion. When the legislature passed the guidelines, in a legitimate attempt to try and even out sentences, um, they defined certain presumptive sentences, as we all know, for typical crimes. For each crime, the typical crime. But they did not remove discretion for sentencing judges. They recognized that nobody is better suited to decide whether this is the typical case represented by that guidelines presumptive sentence or if there are reasons why this is worse than that. And it gave, and the guideline still gives this court discretion when there are aggravating factors um, to give a more serious sentence than what the guidelines presumption calls for. And as you know, we are asking you to do that today. As this court found, there are four aggravating factors that we have identified. They go beyond a list of just what those factors are. We have not just done our homework and found a list. The court made good findings, detailed findings about those factors, and we think they justify uh, a greatly increased sentence. This is not the typical second degree unintentional murder. Supreme Court in our state has said that, and very recently, even one aggravating factor is sufficient to go twice the top of the range. Here we have four. The first one that the court found is an abusive position of trust and authority. And the court specifically found that when Mr. Chauvin was acting as a police officer, he had a position of trust and authority. That is certainly true. We trust police officers. We trust them when we need help. We call them for help. We trust that they're going to take care of the problems that they are assigned to deal with, right? We trust them. We also give them great authority. We give them great power. We give them power to use force that individuals would be prosecuted for using, right? We give them authority to um, arrest, to detain. And with great power, of course, comes great responsibility. So they're not sent out there by themselves to do this. They're given substantial training. 
This court saw all, all of that through the trial in general and in specific to Mr. Chauvin and the other three officers. They're given training on the use of force, the proportional use of force. The force used has to be warranted by the threat. They're given training on de-escalation because we recognize that police officers are called in when people are not having their best day, when people might be affected by mental illness, drug abuse, uh, any number of issues. They're just having the, a bad day, and they're trained for that and should be. And they're taught how to use that to de-escalate and control a situation. They're taught medical intervention. They're taught to provide medical attention to people who need it. Being a police officer is a difficult job. We ask a lot of them. It's a profession, there's no doubt about it. But we give them a substantial amount of training and most officers do it right. This case wasn't about police officers, all police officers. It wasn't about policing. This case was about Derek Chauvin disregarding all that training he received and assaulting Mr. Floyd until he suffocated to death. One of the things that uh, you heard, Your Honor, uh, and the jurors heard uh, that can really encapsulate, I think, a big, uh, a very important issue here. Seven words. In your custody is in your care. And it's a real simple mantra. It's a real easy thing to remember. You're going to take custody of somebody. You have to provide care. You have to do it in a caring way. You can't simply disregard their care. Mr. Chauvin abused his position of trust and authority as a police officer by doing just that, just disregarding all his training. It was an abuse of that because what did he decide to do? We often are forced in this you know, criminal justice system to infer people's state of mind by their conduct and their statements. What was Derek Chauvin's endgame here? What was the plan? Seems apparent the plan was hold him down until we can dump him in an ambulance and no longer have him be our problem. You recall he said to Charles McMillan, it's a big guy, might be on something. That's it. He held Mr. Floyd down as Mr. Floyd begged for his life. He had the other officers help in that regard. And rather than doing the simple expedient of putting him on his side, he said, yeah, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. He was dismissive to that duty of care. We trust that arrestees will be treated with respect, reasonable force, and that their medical needs will be addressed. I'm paraphrasing from the court's findings. That trust was violated. We trust that they will use their authority reasonably. And this was a particularly egregious abuse of that force. Again, paraphrasing the court's findings. The typical second degree murder does not include, does not involve that extent of abuse, of a dearly held uh, position of abuse, or a position of authority and trust by the community and by individuals of the community. Your Honor found that Mr. Floyd was treated by, or with, by Mr. Chauvin with particular cruelty. I think tortured is the right word. We know that, I mean, we've all seen it. Mr. Floyd did not want to be in the back seat. That's it. I mean, that's the, that's the rub. It was the need to get him in that back seat no matter what. And we all saw that once he was pulled out of that back seat, he calmed right down, he even willingly went down to the ground. I'm going down, he said. And he went down to the ground not fighting, not punching, 
and he was placed initially on his side. He's already handcuffed. He's placed on his side in the recovery position, like he should be, because he's trying to breathe. And then quickly placed prone on the ground, face down. Mr. Chauvin put his left knee on George Floyd's neck, his right knee on George Floyd's back, face down on the pavement. Had Officer King sit on Mr. Floyd's waist area and had Officer Lane hold his feet down. You can even see Mr. Floyd trying to pull his feet up. We all are going to fight to breathe. Everybody knows that fear when you all of a sudden realize you're having trouble breathing. It's just innate, right? We want to survive. We know we have to breathe. And there's an automatic reaction when you begin to feel like that is threatened. And you can see Mr. Floyd going through that. He tries to pull his feet up. But he's held down by these three officers while Officer Tao is looking on. And later, of course, goes to keep the people who want to help away. He's placed face down on this pavement so harshly that it rubs the skin off his face. He has injuries to his face from being face down on the pavement. He has injuries to his knuckles from just trying to, to lift himself up. And he's telling Officer Chauvin, I can't breathe. I'm dying. And Mr. Chauvin's response was, uh-huh. And all this time, I mean, imagine what Mr. Floyd is going through. If we're going to talk about particular cruelty and torture, really try to appreciate what he's going through. He knows he's suffocating. We all know that feeling of not being able to breathe enough. And he's begging, he's pleading, and he's being ignored. His concerns are being dismissed by somebody who has taken custody but not care. He was kept in that prone position for nine and a half minutes and was suffocated. There's no other way to say it. That's particularly cruel. That is more cruel than a typical second degree unintentional murder. Significantly more. This is not a momentary gunshot, punch to the face. This is nine and a half minutes of cruelty to a man who was helpless and just begging for his life. This court found that there were children present, standing only a few feet from these officers. These children who were ages 17 and one child age nine. Why is that an aggravating factor? Well, I think everybody can, can figure that out. Right? It's particularly bad to commit a crime in front of children. We've heard a lot of uh, academia about you know, the development of the young brain and how long it can take. And here you got a couple of teenage girls, a nine-year-old girl. How are they going to process this? You know, standing feet from a man being suffocated by police officers. Such a stark sight that one of the children even says, we got to call the police on the police. How do you process that as a nine-year-old? The children were not only present watching a man die. We've all seen, if you haven't, you really need to. Look at George Floyd's face. As he's dying, he's suffering. The children have to watch this. But not only that, it's police officers, and there are people around them wanting to help. And at one point, and sure, they got upset. And at one point, Mr. Chauvin points his mace grabs his mace to keep him back. How does a child look at that? There's another officer screaming at them to get back. The typical second degree unintentional murder doesn't involve children standing feet away watching a nine and a half minute suffocation of a man begging for his life. This court also made a finding that the uh, defendant committed the offense with the involvement of three or more other persons. Lane and King were involved directly in the restraint, and that Tao um, kept the bystanders at bay. 
I've already talked a little bit about Lane and King's role in holding Mr. Floyd down. They recognized uh, that he was pulseless, that Mr. Floyd was pulseless at one point, and yet really made no effort to take care of the person in their custody. Officer Tao watched most of the, the suffocation and then only went over to keep people from giving help. One person who is identified as a medical trained firefighter for the city of Minneapolis, and that was dismissed, like, are we gonna believe her? So they kept trained medical people from providing help. These were all uniformed peace officers, adding to that abuse of trust and authority. You know, I know the defense has asked the court for probation. I'm not going to spend a lot of time arguing that. It's so outside of the realm of, I think, real possibility. This is a murder. I understand some of the arguments made on behalf of Mr. Chauvin. I understand, well, no, I can't understand what his family members and friends are going through. I can't. But it's certainly not enough for a departure to probation for a second degree murder. We believe, Your Honor, that these four aggravating factors and the findings that the court has made certainly justify an upward departure because there are four of them, not standing alone, but in a sense, not overlapping, but coming together to show this is not the typical second degree murder. This is egregious. And this justifies a double upward departure. From the top of the box, which is 180 months, we're asking the court to do a double departure, recognizing all four factors to 360 months. As I mentioned before, Your Honor, this is sentencing. This is the time for victims, right? This is the time for the loved ones of the victim and the community to have a say. Again, I, I, I commend this family. I, I, I commend all of the, the loved ones, the friends, the people that have been involved in this case for tolerating and, and being gracious. None of this, of course, can bring George Floyd back. That's very true. But this is the time for our criminal justice system to say, we hear you. This is the time for their criminal justice system to say, we recognize that this harm you're going through is real, and while we can't feel what you're feeling, we know we can do what the, your criminal justice system should do and recognize the severity of this crime and reflect that in the sentence to be given. It's time for this criminal justice system to say, we recognize this is more serious than the typical second degree unintentional murder. The four reasons the court found reflect that and give this court more than an adequate basis to do that. Your Honor, we ask the court to impose a sentence of 360 months, commitment to the Commissioner of Corrections. As you know, Your Honor, there are no fines in murder cases. And we would ask the court uh, just to reserve the issue of, restitu of restitution. So we can clarify that with the family and present that to the court um, for 30 days. Thank you, Your Honor. Anything further from the state? No, Your Honor. Okay. Mr. Nelson. Oh, I'm sorry. Mr. Blackwell? I'm sorry, Your Honor. Just, um, uh, thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, at this time, uh, the defendant's mother, Carolyn Palenti, would like to address the court. If you could uh, state your full name, spelling each of your names, and proceed when you're ready. Yes. Carolyn, C-A-R-O-L-Y-N, Palenti, P-A-W-L-E-N-T-Y. I am the mother of Derek Scholen. I am here to speak on behalf of 
my entire family. On November 25th, 2020, not only did Derek's life change forever, but so did mine and my family's. Derek devoted 19 years of his life to the Minneapolis Police Department. It has been difficult for me to hear and read what the media, public, and prosecution team believe Derek to be an aggressive, heartless, and uncaring person. I can tell you that is far from the truth. My son's identity has also been reduced to that as, of, that as a racist. I want this court to know that none of these things are true and that my son is a good man. Derek always dedicated his life and time to the police department. Even on his days off, he would call in to see if they needed help. Derek is a quiet, thoughtful, honorable, and self selfless man. He has a big heart and he always has put others before his own. The public will never know the loving and caring man he is, but his family does. Even though I have not spoken publicly, I have always supported him 100% and always will. Derek has played over and over in his head the events of that day. I've seen the toll it has taken on him. I believe a lengthy sentence will not serve Derek well. When you sentence my son, you will also be sentencing me. I will not be able to see Derek, talk to him on the phone, or give him our special hug. Plus the fact that when he is released, his father and I most likely will not be here. Derek, my happiest moment is when I gave birth to you. And my second is when I was honored to pin your police badge on you. I remember you whispering to me, don't stick me with it. Derek, I want you to know I have always believed in your innocence, and I will never waver from that. I have read numerous letters from people around the world that also believe in your innocence. No matter where you go, where you are, I will always be there to visit you. I promise you I will stay strong as we talked about, and I want you to do the same for me. I will do what you told me to do, take care of myself, so I will be here for you when you come home. Remember there is no stronger bond or love than a mother's love. One final thought I want you to remember. Remember, you are my favorite son. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Mr. Nelson.
Thank you very much, Your Honor. Uh, it is my intent that my remarks this afternoon be quite brief. Uh, I do not intend to relitigate the facts of this case, nor spend any substantial time uh, looking at the law. The court is very familiar with the facts of this case, and the parties have fully briefed uh, the court relevant to the sentencing factors. And we recognize that in any case, any sentencing that comes before the court, the court is tasked with a difficult job. The court must craft a sentence that serves the interests of justice, a rather nebulous term. The court must take into consideration the victim impact, public interests, as well as the circumstances and the history of the defendant. And in this case, more than any other, that likely any of us have ever been involved in, that task is exceedingly more difficult. In my remarks today, I just wish to briefly address each of those three considerations, starting with the public impact. As I believe we are all cognizant of, this case is at the epicenter of a cultural and political divide. We tried to keep a lot of that out of the courtroom during the trial and make this case about the facts. But we recognize uh, what has happened as a result of this case. There are a great number of people who will view any sentence you pronounce as overly lenient and insufficient to satisfy justice. But there are an equal number of people who will view any sentence you pronounce as draconian or overbearing. Either way, some percentage of the public will view your sentence as a miscarriage of justice. The intensity of the public interest in this case cannot be understated. I trust that the volume of correspondence that each of us has received from the public at large is indicative of these very sentiments on both sides. As I was informed just yesterday, the Attorney General's office established a website, some web submission, to accept community impact statements. Again, in my understanding is in a little over two weeks, they received over a thousand submissions. Again, on both sides. By my very best estimate, since my representation of Mr. Chauvin began last summer, I would estimate that I have received over 5,000 emails over a thousand voicemails and hundreds and hundreds of handwritten letters, again, from both sides. And I expect that Your Honor has likewise been inundated with public comment and scrutiny. The impact that this case has had on this community is profound. It goes far beyond what happened on May 25th of last year. It has been at the forefront of our national consciousness, and it has weaved its way into every, nearly every facet of our lives, from the entertainment that we consume to the presidential politics, from protests to conspiracy theories. In the end, it is my sincere hope that when this proverbial dust settles, the community, act, uh, the community impact brings forth principled debate and civil public discourse and ultimately leaves a, public, a positive effect on the city of Minneapolis, the state of Minnesota, and the United States. But nevertheless, while this court may consider the community impact, it is for these very same reasons that the court must turn to the foundational legal principles and remember that justice is blind. Law is built on reason and common sense, and it cannot be permitted to be assailed by public opinion. Turning to the second consideration, which is the victim impact, the death of George Floyd. The death of George Floyd was tragic. He is loved by his family members. 
he is loved by his friends, and his death is justifiably mourned by those whose lives he impacted. He is a son, a brother, a father, an uncle, and a friend to many. And as the court heard today, the impact and the loss of his life, of the loss of his life, simply just it can't be simplified. And it will take time. Finally, Your Honor, the court must take into consideration, just like it has to take into consideration the aggravating factors, it needs to take into consideration the mitigating factors. And the mitigating factors as set forth by the sentencing guidelines really point to the TROG analysis, essentially, ultimately, in this case. I'm not going to spend a lot of time, again, arguing for a probationary sentence that's briefed. But that being said, when we look at the TROG factors, who is Derek Chauvin? Derek Chauvin spent 19 years as a Minneapolis police officer. He loved being a police officer. I was contacted during the course of my representation and have had numerous uh, conversations with his fellow police officers or fellow police officers that worked with Derek, some retired, some still active. And they told me that he was a solid police officer, that he did his job, that if somebody asked him to do a particular task, he never complained, he did it. One person told me that if, one of his sergeants told me that if I had asked him to dig a ditch for eight hours, he would have picked up a shovel and he would have never complained for a second. He would have done his job. He was decorated as a police officer. Multiple life-saving awards. He was decorated for valor. He was proud to be a police officer because what he liked to do was help people. And as the statistics show, the vast majority of police work is helping people. He was proud to be a Minneapolis police officer. He served his country as the United States in the United States Army. And he too is a son and a brother and a father and a friend. He too, his life, the, the life he's lived He's not coming into this as a career criminal with six points, five points, four points. He's coming into this never having violated the law because he lived an honorable life and he attempted to live an honorable life. Derek Chauvin was not even scheduled to work on May 25th, 2020. He volunteered because there was short staffing at the time. I know from numerous conversations that I've had with Derek that his brain is littered with what ifs. What if I just had not agreed to go in that day? What if things had gone differently? What if I never responded to that call? What if, what if, what if? The truth of the matter is, and the end result is, is that we are here after a jury verdict, finding him guilty of these offenses, and the court's consideration should not only be focused on the aggravating factors, but the mitigating factors as well. The Minnesota Sentencing Guidelines Commission was established for a reason, and yes, the court in circumstances like these has discretion to go beyond and aggravate a sentence beyond the presumptive sentences established by the sentencing guidelines. But the sentencing guidelines don't differentiate between second degree murders. Someone robs a liquor store, a police officer is involved in an incident, and a person dies in police custody. The law presumes, the legislature presumes, that the, the sentencing guidelines as established is a su sufficient penalty for all of the second degree murder categories or cases you would see. From 2019 back to 2010, a total of 90 people were sentenced 
for second degree murder. Those sentences, those people, there were more than that, but people who had a zero criminal history score, more than 90 people were sentenced. 67% or 60 of those 90 people received a guideline sentence of 150 months. So two thirds of all people in this same position received a guideline sentence. 20% received an aggravated sentence, 18 of the 90. And 12, or excuse me, 13% or 12 individuals were granted mitigated departures. So if the legislature and the intent of the sentencing guidelines is to eliminate sentencing disparity, the law should presume that the guideline sentence is what is appropriate in this case. Judge may take, you may take into consideration at this point those aggravating factors, but you have to counterbalance them, which is the goal of the law with the mitigating factors. I know that this has been an incredibly difficult case for the Floyd family to have to endure. The state of Minnesota, uh, likewise, the prosecutors in this case have endured quite a bit, as has Mr. Chauvin's family. This is a case that is change, has changed the world to some degree, and I hope it's positive. But it's my hope that the court follows the sentencing guidelines, applies the law in a reasoned manner, and imposes a just sentence. Thank you, Mr. Chauvin. Would you join Mr. Nelson at the lectern? Uh, Mr. Chauvin, th this is your opportunity if you wish to uh, give any input to the court. And so I turn it over to you and your attorney. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, at this time, due to some additional legal matters at hand, I'm not able to give a full formal statement at this time. Um, but br very briefly, though, I uh, do want to give my condolences to the Floyd family. Um, there's going to be some other information in the future that would be of interest and uh, I hope things will give you some some peace of mind. Thank you. And I'll note that I did read your comments in the pre-sentence investigation as well. Thanks, Frank. All right, we are going to take a 15 minute recess so that I can complete the sentencing order based on what I've heard today and let's reconvene at 245. We're in recess. You heard the judge. They are taking a break now. We did hear from the former officer Chauvin, uh, noting that unable to say certain things right now, being a bit cryptic, but offering his condolences to the Floyd family and suggesting there will be some things I think that he said will bring them uh, peace uh, without elaborating. Uh, NBC's Gabe Gutierrez has been following this case since the beginning and joins us now. Very clear, the prosecution, uh, the state, are arguing for the maximum penalty, 30 years. Um, lawyers are for, for Chauvin asking for time served and probation. Uh, you have moved from where we saw you earlier. You've got quite a crowd. Describe the scene. Uh, yeah, Lester. So we moved here uh, a few minutes ago as this crowd began to gather here. So what they wanted uh, to listen to this in this uh, in this uh, square, actually, it's right outside the courthouse, and they've been listening through a speaker here, and they've been reacting as they uh, as we hear this uh, sentencing unfold. And I just uh, spoke with um, family over here. You guys came here from Chicago, right? Yes, we did. So Willie what's your Burton. name, sir? Willie Burton. Willie Burton. What's your reaction to what you've heard so far? They just took a break. I know you were not listening to the last few seconds, but former officer Chauvin spoke very briefly. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to get your thoughts. Why was it so important for you to be here? And what do you think will be an appropriate punishment? I'm here today from the city of Chicago. I brought my daughter. Uh, my daughter is uh, somebody of, of the autistic spectrum. Mm -hmm. And I want to make sure she feels, breathes, and knows what justice looks like and sees it from the ground level. 
Um, justice is a long process. Mm -hmm. um, we have to make sure our kids are partner mm -hmm. with that process. But today is a very important step on people realistically seeing if the government and the city and the state is going to hold themselves accountable to make sure that we see what real justice looks like and not twisted justice. So the prosecution has come back and they have said that they would want to see 30 years in prison for former officer Chauvin. The defense has said that they would want uh, probation in time served. They're arguing that, you know, he's already served his time and they want probation. What's your reaction to that? What do you think would be appropriate? Would you want to see on the higher end or what, what are you thinking uh, for the uh, sentencing here? What would be appropriate is whatever message is sent to police across the nation to make sure that they don't do this, that they understand what um, de-escalation looks like. If this can't send a signal to show that this doesn't need to happen again with police doing senseless killings, then the message wouldn't serve today in relation to the sentencing. Thank you, sir, very much for talking to us. We really appreciate it. Um, so, Lester, this is, um, you know, there's, they're waiting here uh, to see what the sentence will, will be handed down. Uh, Lester, as you know, we were here two months ago in this very spot, actually, right outside the courthouse, and it was a similar scene as a smaller crowd this time, but back then, people were listening uh, to the verdict uh, come down, and there were cheers that erupted. I can tell you, you know, when we heard speaking of the people here in the crowd, they would want to see on the higher end uh, Chauvin be sentenced to at least 20, 25 years. Again, prosecutors asking for 30. He faces a maximum of 40 years in prison. As you've reported, Lester, uh, prosecutors, um, you know, they say because of aggravating factors, he should get on the higher end of that, uh, of those sentencing guidelines. But again, there is high anticipation here. This is a community that has been waiting for the sentence to be handed down for quite a while. Again, um, they are taking a break now while we wait for court to resume. Lester. All right, Gabe, thanks very much. Mary Moriarty is a former chief public defender for Hennepin County. Mary, thank you for being with us. Uh, let's talk about those aggravating factors. Clearly, the assistant attorney general uh, made it very clear this is not, in his view, a typical second-degree murder case. How important are the, these factors in determining the sentence? They're extremely important, and I think the judge gave us uh, a heads up about that when he wrote a memo after he found four of the five aggravating factors that the attorney general was looking for. So he wrote that he thought that Derek Chauvin abused his position of trust as a peace officer, and he also wrote quite a bit about the particular cruelty that Chauvin inflicted upon George Floyd, that this was a, a lengthy death that George Floyd had been begging for his life, um, that it must have been terrifying. And, and so I think we're going we're about to hear Judge Cahill directly address Chauvin and I believe talk about these aggravating factors. We have uh, I don't want to presume what the judge will decide here, but typically in, in, a, in a murder case uh, like this, will the judge have already really come upon a number uh, before actually addressing the, uh, the, the court? I don't know that there's a typical murder case like this, but yes, I'm pretty sure that Judge Cahill already knows uh, the number that, that he is going to give. He has spent a lot of time researching. Remember that both sides did file memos, pretty extensive memos on what they wanted the sentence to be. He's also had an opportunity to look at that defense memo pretty closely, which it was interesting to me because I would describe it as being as very defiant, which you could see throughout what we've already seen. Um, even from Chauvin's mother, who I don't think, I mean, it might have been good for Derek Chauvin to hear his mother there to support him, but she maintained that narrative that he did nothing wrong. Um, you heard no empathy from her towards the Floyd family. Um, she talked about how he was innocent. And, and so um, that narrative goes through the defense memo. And they also describe George Floyd's death as being relatively quick, which is not at all what Judge Cahill found. And, and so part of me thought that that defense memo wasn't really even meant for Judge Cahill, because one of the things that judges look for is an expression of some type of insight into what you might have done differently and an expression of remorse or some kind of empathy on behalf of the, the person. And actually, for the first time, uh, we heard Derek Chauvin express uh, empathy towards George Floyd's family. Yeah, and we note uh, Chauvin and, and his defense asking for probation with time served. So, as you note, not an acknowledgement 
uh, necessarily uh, of the conviction. Uh, we also heard at the beginning of these uh, victim impact uh, statements uh, from uh, uh, Floyd's family. His seven-year-old daughter, Gianna, spoke as well as Floyd's brother, Terrence, and addressed Chauvin directly. Here it is. We used to have dinner meals every single night before we went to bed. My uh, my daddy always used to help me brush my teeth. Oh, do you miss him helping brush your teeth? Yes. How do you hope that the world remembers him? Well, they help him because. Um, those mean people did something to him. Yeah. If you could say anything to your daddy right now, what would it be? It would be, I miss you and I love you. I actually talked to a few people and, um, I wanted to know from the man himself, why? What were you thinking? What was going through your head when you had your knee on my brother's neck? Why, why, when you, when you knew that he posed no threat anymore? That was uh, some of the victim uh, impact statements made during this session. Again, we're on a short break here. The judge now taking into consideration all he's heard. He will come back here shortly, and we will likely learn the sentence for Derek Chauvin. NBC News legal analyst and former federal prosecutor Paul Butler is with us. Uh, Paul, give me your sense of, of what we have heard so far in this hearing. Lester, the victim impact testimony was extremely powerful and moving. Mr. Floyd's seven-year-old daughter, she misses him helping her brush her teeth every night. Karen Floyd, Mr. Floyd's brother, was angry. He just wants Chauvin to explain what he was thinking. He asked the judge to impose the maximum punishment under the jail, was the expression he used. Another one of Mr. Floyd's brothers said that he hasn't had a good night's sleep since Mr. Floyd was murdered. So for Mr. Floyd's loved ones, this case isn't about police accountability or the national reckoning on race. This is about a little girl who will never get to go on a plane ride with her dad. Uh, that moved everyone who heard it, including the judge. Paul, we uh, heard the attorney for Derek Chauvin really describe to the judge the pressure that he may feel like he's under, uh, given the very public nature of this case, the fact that it's in everyone's living room and uh, people are following it the way they are. Um, how much reality is there in that in terms of, of the judge? He's got these aggravating factors, but he's certainly not doing this in a vacuum. He understands the intense interest over this. I thought that was effective lawyering by Mr. Nelson. The defense attorney acknowledged that this case has traumatized the nation, but also inspired an important debate about policing. And he also accurately stated that whatever sentence the judge imposes will be seen by some as too light and some as too, neat, as too harsh. Interestingly, Lester, he essentially testified for his client saying that Mr. Chauvin constantly asked himself, ask himself every day how things could have gone differently. The problem, though, is that Mr. Chauvin himself never expressed responsibility. He never expressed deep remorse for the trauma that he's caused. This probably won't impact his sentence much. The judge understands that Mr. Chauvin is appealing to conviction and also facing federal charges. And so, in that sense, Chauvin was limited in what he could say. But had he offered some deeper sense of remorse and empathy, uh, that might have made a difference to the family. All right, uh, Paul Butler, thank you for standing by with us. NBC's Megan Fitzgerald is in George Floyd Square, where obviously this has been being very watched very carefully. Megan? 
Yeah, Lester, you know, this is the place, obviously, where George Floyd was killed, just directly behind me here. And uh, worth noting that just a couple of weeks ago, it was a group of community members, along with the city, that uh, reopened this area, because you'll remember it was closed to traffic. Uh, but despite that, I can tell you that the same sentiment, uh, the same passion, the same reasons why people have come here still remains. I want to kind of show you around what's happening here. Not a large group of people, but nonetheless, people who have come out here today uh, to remember George Floyd's life. And this is what this area... Uh, uh, has always been a place for people to pray, for them to reflect, also to remember the lives uh, of other people killed at the hands of police. I've been speaking with people out here, and just moments ago, there were chants of 30 years. Uh, for many people, a high sentence is closure for them. Of course, we know that the other three officers will stand trial in March. Uh, but for them, you know, this is a big day. This is a day that sort of uh, wraps it all up. Uh, the officer that kneeled on George Floyd's neck for nine minutes and 29 seconds, the power of being in this location uh, when they hear the verdict uh, is something that they say can't be compared. So people are here with their cell phones out, uh, waiting and hoping, they say, uh, for a just verdict of 30 years, something they say will send a message to the nation. Megan Lester. Fitzgerald and George Floyd Square Force as we all wait. Uh, Judge Cahill still uh, in chambers right now. We expect to see him again shortly in this uh, uh, sentencing will go forward. I want to bring in NBC legal analyst Danny Savalos. Uh, Danny, I want to get your thoughts, but especially on a uh, hearing from uh, former officer Chauvin's mother, um, you know, what effect that may or may not have in your view. It was a, definitely a very sympathetic moment for Derek Chauvin's mother, but it may not have played well with the judge because sentencing judges don't want to hear someone get up and say how this sentencing will hurt me. I'm going to lose out because I'm losing a son. That's the kind of thing that judges might not take the right way because it's really about either remorse or the harm that was done to the victim. So while I have all kinds of sympathy for Derek Chauvin's mom, and look, it's hard to get up there, and this is probably the hardest speaking moment of her life, uh, you know, for Derek Chauvin, the defense probably hopes that she didn't uh, push the judge to think that, oh, this is just about my loss, my loss of my son and how my son's life has changed and how my life has changed. You know, sentencing uh, is really, really a challenging time for both sides. But as defense counsel, it's your duty to put every speck of information out there that may help your client that the judge would allow in. Danny, thank you very much. We'll ask you to continue standing by as we stand by and await the return of the judge. And for this uh, 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 sentencing to go forward, um, we do want to note that we did hear from a former officer, Chauvin, uh, near the end. Uh, first time we've heard any substantial words uh, from him. Even so, he was a bit guarded, seeming to be acknowledging uh, an appeals process. But here's what he said in the court. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, at this time, due to some additional legal matters at hand. I'm not able to give a full formal statement at this time. Um, but very briefly though, I uh, do want to give my condolences to the Floyd family. Um, there's going to be some other information in the future that would be of interest. And uh, I hope things will give you some, some peace of mind. Thank you. And uh, again, uh, Derek Chauvin in the courtroom just a few minutes ago before the judge retired uh, to consider what he's heard this uh, early part of the day and uh, announce uh, his final sentence against Chauvin. Uh, we want to go to uh, Jonathan Capehart now, opinion writer for The Washington Post, host of MSNBC's The Sunday Show with Jonathan Capehart. He joins us now. What are your thoughts on uh, what we heard from Chauvin and his offer of condolences to the family? Well, one, Lester, it was interesting to hear his voice since he did not take the stand in his own defense during his trial. Um, I found it interesting that he not only expressed his condolences to the Floyd family, but looked at them uh, to express those condolences. The cryptic nature of this new information that he says he believes will give the Floyd family, quote, peace of mind, I'm curious to know what that is. Because given, given the, um, the impact statements from the two Floyd, the Floyd uh, nephew and the two brothers, I, can't, I don't see what could possibly come out that would bring them any kind of peace of mind. I believe it was um, Philonis Floyd who said, quote, my family and I have been handed a life sentence, which I found interesting, especially after 
um, Derek Chauvin's mother, Carolyn Pawlenty, said in her um, statement, when you sentence to the judge, when you sentence my son, you will be sentencing me. These are very powerful um, moments in the courtroom where you get to hear definitely the, the victim statements, but I wasn't expecting to hear from uh, Derek Chauvin's mother. And so I am actually very curious to see how this plays out, especially given what Danny just said about um, how that might impact the judge. A very, very um, powerful uh, uh, hour or so that we've been watching, Lester. And, and as you know, Jonathan, this has been seen broadly as a, as a watershed moment in the whole issue of race and, and policing. But once again, Mr. Blackwell at the beginning, uh, you know, for the prosecution, making the point that this was not about policing. This was about one bad officer uh, who ended up murdering uh, someone he was, he was trying to take into custody. So how should we be viewing whatever happens here today? Well, I mean, I, I understand what the prosecution was trying to do, trying to make this a very discreet case and have it be on the facts on the ground, um, following the evidence and keeping the trial focused, keeping the witnesses focused, keeping the, the judge focused and not and the jury focused and not distracted by all of the other things that were at play, the, the politics that got involved, and also how the murder of George Floyd fits into the larger narrative of this country when it comes to African Americans, African American men in particular, and their interactions, sometimes fatal interactions with law enforcement. They, as, as much as they were able to keep it separate there in the courtroom, out in the court of public opinion, they are intricately linked. The nation was watching um, nervously when the sentence came, uh, when the verdict came down because of viewing the, sh the, the Chauvin trial as part of the larger narrative. Today, um, even though those words were said again in the courtroom, the nation is going to be watching to see that one hurdle was reached and a pol white police officer found guilty for murdering uh, an unarmed black man. Now, how much time will that poli former police officer serve for killing that unarmed black man? And if there's one thing that Eric Nelson said that I agree with, no matter what sentence the judge hands down, there will be people on all sides of this issue who quite possibly uh, might not be satisfied. Most watching at home or in the workplace, uh, but some are watching from across that courtroom. That's where we go to Gabe Gutierrez again uh, with a growing crowd uh, waiting to hear what the what the judge hands down. Gabe. Uh, hi there, Lester. Well, yes, they're continuing to chant Black Lives Matter here, anxiously awaiting uh, the sentence. I'm joined by Athena Papagenopoulos here, a Minneapolis resident. Uh, she has organized a few of the protests here in this community. And why was it so important for you to be physically right here, right now, listening to this sentence, essentially in person? You're listening through a speaker out here. Yeah, it's just important to show that we're still together with the community and that we're going to be here for the community and the family, like no matter what happens throughout the entire process. And Athena, as my uh, colleague, I think uh, photojournalist Bill Angelucci kind of pans around and shows the crowd. Athena, what was your reaction to some of the things we just heard from? Uh, George Floyd's young daughter, Gianna, gave a, gave a message, and so did uh, several of his family members. What was the most powerful uh, section for you? What was the most powerful moment? It's the fact that she has the strength to be up there doing what she's doing. She's a young black woman, just really a child, and the whole situation is just so beyond heartbreaking. But to have to put someone up there time and time again constantly be in the spotlight. Her presence in general is amazing. There were some in the crowd here that gave a strong reaction when they heard Derek Chauvin's mother as well as Chauvin himself very briefly uh, get up and speak. What was your reaction when you heard that? I understand when you have a child, you want to back them no matter what, you know, and their wrongs and their rights and what they do. But I just don't have respect for that because he's clearly just going through the motions of this trial. So for her to have more emotion than him throughout this entire process and that small snippet, I just... I didn't feel good about it. And Athena, we were here in this spot just two months ago when the verdict came down. There were cheers that erupted here. It seemed like a weight had been lifted off of this community in Minneapolis. What do you consider to be the historic significance of this moment? And what do you consider an appropriate punishment for Derek Chauvin to be? 
we can't get the appropriate punishment because, you know, with the laws and everything, but it has to be maximum of what they're willing to give or else that's just as bad as them saying no. You don't get it because if we get, you know, 10, 12, 13 years, that's them saying that you're not worthy of what I feel my child is worthy of. And that's ultimately what it comes down to. And um, just just being here with the community just makes it all better because during that day I couldn't and a lot of people couldn't like take in yet that moment when you heard that yes and all those cheers going on it's like yes okay that's the final that's the first push but here we are on the final push where it's like you're going to show us right now during this sentencing what we actually mean as a community and the world entirely and just the basis of black lives. Athena, thank you so much for joining thank us. You. I really appreciate it. Uh, Lester, you know, we've been speaking with folks like her really throughout the afternoon. And as you can see, this crowd has begun to gather here, start with a few dozen uh, kind of at the start of the sentencing. And they are now anxiously awaiting uh, this uh, court hearing to resume. Uh, but what you just heard from Athena is something we've been hearing over and over again. Significant, not just for, not just for this community, Lester, uh, but obviously across the country. We keep uh, talking to people from Chicago, uh, from Michigan. And also uh, this woman here, are you from Minneapolis? Yes. Marcia. Marcia, born uh, and tell me. Raised here. Sure, born and raised. Why is it so important for Gabe, you to be here uh, right now? Gabe, we're going to break away from you. Uh, uh, the judge is back in the courtroom. The input you did, not just the people who were in the courtroom here, but also those who provided written statements, uh, both from the Floyd family and the defendant's family. I've read all the impact statements that were submitted earlier, and listened carefully to all the input here today, and it is truly appreciated that you took the time to stay with this case and to provide me with input. I have reviewed the pre-sentence investigation and carefully considered all the facts of the case and the law, but my comments are actually going to be very brief because most of it's going to be in writing. I have a 22-page memorandum that is going to be attached to the sentencing order. And why am I doing it in writing? To emphasize the fact that determining the appropriate sentence in any case, and in this case, is a legal analysis. It's applying the rule of law to the facts of an individual and specific case. And that is why, as opposed to trying to be being profound here on the record, I prefer that you read the legal analysis that explains how I determine the sentence in this case. What the case is, or what the sentence is not based on, is emotion or sympathy. But at the same time, I want to acknowledge the deep and tremendous pain that all the families are feeling, especially the Floyd family. You have our sympathies. And I acknowledge and hear the pain that you are feeling. I acknowledge the pain not only of those in this courtroom, but the Floyd family who are outside this courtroom and other members of the community. It has been painful throughout Hennepin County, throughout the state of Minnesota, and even the country. But most importantly, we need to recognize the pain of the Floyd family. I'm not going to attempt to be profound or clever because it's not the appropriate time. I'm not basing my sentence also on public opinion. I'm not basing it on any attempt to send any messages. A trial court judge, the job of a trial court judge is to apply the law to specific facts and to deal with individual cases. And so, Mr. Chauvin, as to count one, based on the verdict of the jury, finding you guilty of unintentional second degree murder while committing a felony under Minnesota Statute 609.19 subdivision 2 paren 1, it is the judgment of the court that you now stand convicted of that offense. Pursuant to Minnesota Statute uh, section 60904, Counts two and three will remain unadjudicated as they are lesser offenses of count one. As sentence for count one, the court commits you to the custody of the Commissioner of Corrections for a period of 270 months, that's 270, 
That is a 10-year addition to the presumptive sentence of 150 months. This is based on your uh, abuse of a position of trust and authority and also the particular cruelty shown to George Floyd. You're granted credit for 199 days already served. Pay the mandatory surcharge of $78 to be paid from prison wages. You're prohibited from possessing firearms, ammunition, or explosives for the remainder of your life. Provide a DNA sample as required by law. Register as a predatory offender as required by law. And then you will receive a copy of the order and also the attached memorandum explaining the court's analysis. Anything further from the state? If this needs to be said, we just ask that it be executed forthwith. Defendant is remanded to the custody of the sheriff to be transported uh, back to the DOC or whichever custody is currently holding him. Anything from the defense? No, you are. All right. Thank you. We are adjourned. The uh, judge not reading his full sentencing memorandum and getting very virtually right to the sentencing and sentencing uh, Derek Chauvin, the former Minneapolis police officer, to 22 and a half years in prison. That is less than the maximum, but certainly far more uh, than Chauvin and his attorneys were asking for. Let's go to Gabe Gutierrez right now, who is across the street from the courthouse, where we've been watching a growing crowd. Uh, assume the word is getting there now. What's the reaction you're seeing? Uh, hey, Lester. Well, uh, I should let you know, this crowd is maybe on a 30-second delay from where they've been hearing, so it is just starting to spread through the crowd right now. It was quiet. Um, people are kind of taking it all in, waiting to kind of process, um, and, and I'm trying to listen for some reaction now. But uh, the young woman we just spoke with uh, a short time ago, Athena, you were just listening to it. So 22 and a half years, the sentence handed down to Derek Chauvin. That is 10 years more than the recommended guidelines. You just heard what the judge had to say. What's your immediate reaction? Um, I'm taking this as a win for my community right now. Um, we needed this. It could have gone just so far left that there was no coming back. He said, you know, that he's not doing this, you know, for the public, but he knew he really, really had to. It just had to be done this way. And I'm really thankful, thankful, so thankful for my community and the world and just showing that we can't go on like this. Um, but I also take a second back to think about all of the other people this has happened to with the knee on the neck since George Floyd. So I'm taking it as this is a small, a small victory right now and I'm just so appreciative but it's going to take me a second to process it and be like okay you have 22 years for him now let's move forward with who has continued to do this after. Thank you very much Thank Athena you. I really appreciate you talking to you. Lester and I was just uh, starting to speak with a Minneapolis resident uh, right before uh, the hearing came back and ma'am hi how are you? Yeah they gave yeah 22 and a half years ma'am is what they just gave him so the word is trickling out here Lester ma'am what's your immediate reaction Derek Chauvin sentence to 22 and a half years in prison. Maybe that is, maybe, he's setting an example out of other dirty cops here. It's good that he, it's bad what he did, but he's not shot other black men here. And they say he has a criminal charges, which is true, yeah. but the police won't, they didn't charge him for it. Well, thank you, ma'am, very, very much for talking to us. I know it's kind of hard to get some information here, but 22 and a half years. Is what yeah, thank, yeah. thank you very much, ma'am. So, Lester, again, kind of a, you know, a, a situation here where we're trying to get as much reaction as we can. And again, word is starting to trickle out. Um, the judge uh, said uh, the sentence first in months, so, you know, people are trying to make the calculation here, again, to 22 and a half years. But, sir, uh, the, the, um, the, situ the situation here, the sentence just handed down 22 and a half years. We just spoke with this uh, gentleman from Chicago. What's your reaction? Guilty was served. I don't think that that's enough time to send a message that needs to be sent to say that justice is trying to work for people of color. It's it's a dent, but we still feel empty today. We feel empty because it still feels like twisted justice in which we're all so accustomed to, you know, but we did get a guilty and then we did get time, but mm -mm. It's, it's, we just feel void today.
you know, it's still, it still feels void. Thank you very much, sir. So, Lester, again, some uh, conflicting feelings here. Some folks, uh, you may be able to hear somebody behind me. There is a bit of anger here that uh, they wanted more. Certainly many people uh, in this community, uh, they had wanted the maximum. But 40 years, legal, ex legal experts, of course, um, said that that wasn't likely. Prosecutors asked for 30 years. So, again, 22 and a half years for Derek Chauvin on that second-degree murder charge. A mixed reaction so far. Some people saying it was enough. So they wanted more than 20 at least. Others, as you can hear in the distance, perhaps, there is some anger. They want they wanted more, Lester. So we're continuing to grab, uh, to get reaction here as this crowd continues to grow. But for now, I'm going to send in that back to you, Lester. All right, uh, Gabe, thanks very much. 22 and a half years. That would uh, put uh, Mr. Chauvin at 67 uh, when he is released from prison. Let's go to Paul Butler right now. Uh, Paul, is this in the neighborhood of where you thought the judge might come down in this case? It's actually higher, Lester. The judge essentially threw the book at Mr. Chauvin. 22 years sets a new precedent in Minnesota. The only other officer to be convicted of murder in that state got 12 and a half years. So the judge said his sentence was about legal analysis, not about emotion or sympathy. And he specifically said he was not trying to send a message. But make no mistake, this case will impact other officers. This is a tough sentence. Uh, Mr. Chauvin will not see the light of day for decades. And hopefully, uh, that will impact how other officers approach their jobs, knowing that when they violate their badge, abuse the public trust in the way that Mr. Chauvin did, there will be serious consequences. All right, Paul Butler, thank you for being part of our coverage. That concludes our breaking news coverage of the sentencing of Derek Chauvin for the murder of George Floyd. We'll have much more, of course, when I see you back here for NBC Nightly News. For now, I'm Lester Holt in New York. Good day, everyone. I'm Ellison Morris. You are watching NBC News Now. Here's what's happening. Former Minneapolis... Captain of our destiny. We are. All we got to do is stand up and love one another. Please keep the solidarity and unity in everything you do. August 21st, show up in Kenosha and show little Jake we're still rallying for justice for him. And we're going to keep supporting all these other families and cooling for it. Love y'all. Big up. That's right. Yeah, man. Let us all If y'all ain't in the media, you fuck y'all. And fuck your story. And fuck everything you cover. Because I'm fucking like We ain't a fucking story. We got a fucking zoo. Say that. Huh? Fuck out of here. Y'all ain't bring your water to none of the fucking George Floyd. Y'all ain't caring about the animal feet. Y'all ain't caring about whiskey. Y'all ain't caring for a fucking story. Say that. Say that. This man is black every the second. Truth. This is not a fucking story. We're not zoo exhibits. We're not fucking animals. I fought American justice more than anyone else in history. Corporate media will not cover this man is speaking the truth. My name is Nicholas Morris. I fought for American justice in Leadville, Colorado, the highest city in the United States of America, the U.S. Supreme Court. This man is speaking the truth. American corporate media will not cover it. Most of the people are fucking walking away from the work. I've documented American injustice at all levels of the U.S. Supreme Court. None of these corporate, none of these fucking corporate motherfuckers will cover it. 30,000 fucking pages. 10 years of my life. But if it's one they want to hear it. For years, they always document the class and document the low class as animals. Same with me. That's all they do. And they're the fucking animals. They're the beast. And all you fucking corporate media walk away from this. I dedicated my life to this fight for justice, and none of these fucking corporate media. All y'all care about black trauma. They was labeled black trauma and putting it on display. Anyone, anyone from the corporate media cover the most liberal, 
research documented of American injustice. Will anyone cover? One goddamn media. I can prove to the, the chief, international chief of police. And now we get yeah, the fucking police. Is anyone from the media going to cover this? Hey, can we get everybody back in the circle, please? Hey, everybody back in the circle, please. Right on. Let's not be all over. Can we get everybody back in the circle? Hey, can we get everybody back in the circle, please? Can we get everybody back? Y'all all hear me talk, but ain't nobody coming back in the circle. This is why shit in Minnesota happened, because don't nobody want to stand the fuck up, and don't nobody want to come together. They scream in unity, but where the fuck is everybody at? All divided. Fuck yeah. That's why we fucked up in Minnesota. Because that's why they're doing the prime example, because don't nobody know how to come together.
that will move us much further along the road to justice. I'm not talking about the kind of change that takes decades. I'm talking about real change, concrete change that real people improve the lives of officers who want to protect and serve and make everyone safer. Every one of these bills at every level of government is critical for helping our families, our law enforcement officers, communities, and the country heal. Above all, Congress has still not passed the country heal. Above all, Congress has still not passed the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. I call on leaders and members of Congress to pass the best and strongest version of this bill that can be passed and to pass it now. President Biden called on the Congress to pass this bill. It must be passed. Lives are depending upon it. It's just that simple. I'm speaking now to law enforcement leaders. At this historic moment, law enforcement leaders are in a position to finally put in place policy, training, mechanisms, and accountability that can build a police department that people can really trust and rely on. And the elected leaders that they answer to must support and empower these law enforcement leaders to do it. Where there is distrust between community and police, there is less cooperation between community and police. And at a moment where violent crime is spiking across the nation in major cities, we simply cannot afford the distrust. The schism leaves us all a little less safe. But trust and cooperation must be earned. You cannot clean a dirty wound. By bringing accountability in law enforcement, you actually promote public safety. I say to those law enforcement leaders, make no mistake, this is something your officers are asking for. In the aftermath of George Floyd's death, 14 Minneapolis police, Depart police department officers signed an open letter condemning Derek Chauvin's actions and embracing the call for reform and change. These 14 officers don't only speak for themselves, they speak for hundreds across the country. These officers and ones like them want you to support officers who treat everyone with dignity and respect. They want you to support officers who are taking risks to speak up and demand that we do better. They want you to hold their colleagues accountable who refuse to serve communities with dignity and respect. Why do officers want accountability? Well, think of the nine-year-old girl wearing a t-shirt that said love across the front who witnessed George Floyd's murder and how she will feel 20 years from now as she may be speaking to her own children about whether to trust law enforcement. The damage that Derek Floyd's crime inflicted upon the reputation of officers is undermining the ability for people to trust. And that is very tragic. It's not fair to judge all police officers by Derek Chauvin's actions, but some people inevitably will generalize unless there is true accountability. You just can't hurt, hurt, heal a dirty wound, and when there's little trust, sadly, there's little safety. When law enforcement leaders take clear steps to build in accountability and prioritize wellness for their officers, they will have the officers respect, trust between officers and the people they are dedicated to protecting and serving. Let me speak to prosecutors. We believe and we state and declare that no one is above the law and no one is beneath it. A police officer is not above the law and George Floyd certainly is not beneath the law. When after a thorough review, prosecutors believe that they have probable cause that anyone, including someone operating with the authority of law and law enforcement, has violated the law, our prosecutors must be vigorous, visible, and swift. I'm speaking to community now. 
we need every community member to continue the call for real reform and meaningful change. Peacefully, constructively, but clearly, this is a moment for change, and your call for it is making it happen. This means everyone who wants to live in a society with dignity and respect as core values, everyone who wants to be safe in their homes and on the street, everyone who wants to get the help that they need, everyone who wants their loved ones to get home safely. This is what we need to do. What will happen if we don't do it? We will slip deeper into a century-long cycle of inaction. We can and we must make another choice. The choice to break the old paradigm and end the cycle of inaction. The choice to act for accountability and justice. The choice to transform ourselves and our country. For the sake of all the lives that have been lost, for the sake of the ter terrible sacrifices that too many families like the Floyds have had to make, and for the sake of the many officers who strive to serve and protect with dignity and honor and high standards, and for the sake of the community. Time is up. It's time to act. We're counting on you. We're counting on each other. Finally, I want to thank this extraordinary team of prosecutors. It has been my deepest honor to work with you. You all are the best, and I'm honored to be your colleague. I want to send an another strong signal of love and friendship to the Floyd family who have done so much to uphold the dignity of our community. I want to thank the Hennepin County Attorney's Office and Mike Freeman, who have been side by side with us and have done such a good job, and we appreciate their work. And I want to thank the witnesses who courageously stepped forward for George Floyd on May 25th to, at risk to themselves and came back a year later to testify about what they saw. And lastly, I want to thank the community for making the call for justice. That's it. Thank you very much. For this verdict of guilty, 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 right now we are reacting to 22 and a half years. The question that many of us have today is show me a crime more heinous than what Derek Chauvin has done. Show me a crime where someone sits on the back of a human being, does not let him breathe for 9 minutes and 29 seconds. Show me a crime where an individual who works for the government, who is trained, who has served and has been in that office for a long time to commit that kind of murder on broad daylight while children watched, while community members watched, while firefighters, off-duty firefighters begged to intervene. This was the worst murder by an officer that we know of today. And this judge had an opportunity to show that the law allows him to bring back 30 years. Instead, he brought back what is comfortable for white people in this country. He brought back something that will make many Americans say, that should be enough. Well, if you go into the prison system in this country, there are black people who have gone into prison for far less and who have been in prison for crimes are much less, for longer sentences. Why did Derek Chauvin get this treatment where the law now had to be exercised for him to find a middle ground? Where was the middle ground for George Floyd when he begged for his life? Where was the middle ground for the countless of lives that many of you never covered, never cared for, that have been killed in darkness all over this country? We are saddened today to know that the justice system is not full for us. It is partial for us. And we do not accept partial justice in this country. And black people in this country need to wake up because we are seeing this everywhere. And today, the most noted case, the most watched case, the most horrifying case got a mediocre sentence. And we are not happy but we are also not surprised. 
This is a country that has a legacy of genocide against Native Americans and the continued enslavement of African Americans through mass incarceration, among other things. We now ask for the federal government, in their case, to bring forth swifter justice. Because this state, for many of you who came in here today, flying into Minneapolis, flying into this state, I want you to know this is one of the most racist states in the union. The racism in this country is different in different parts. But up here in Minnesota, the racism here it comes with a smile. It comes with a gift. The racism here is problematic. And so we demand justice for George Floyd, and we will not end that, because we know justice for George Floyd is really justice for all the families. And we will not stop fighting. We will not stop caring, because we know the justice system in this country has to be full for all Americans, not partial. Hey, back up, back up. And I believe that. come back as the family says. That's fine. I just have to get my Yes, yes. Of course. Thank you. Thank you. We'll have the family now. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, I just have to. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Okay. I need to move the same. I'm not with the medium. Um, we don't need it. Do you want it? I was wondering because I should put this on there. Do we want it? Is it good? I don't think anybody. We don't want it. Okay. Attorney Crump, Rev. How you doing, Jaylani, do you need your Jaylani? Uh, no, no, no. It's New York. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to get underway. My name is Jennifer McGuffin. I'm the Chief Communications Officer for the law firm of Romanucci and Blandin. We are going to hear from Reverend Al Sharpton, who will start us in prayer, followed by the legal team, Attorney Ben Crump, Attorney Antonio Romanucci, Jeff Storms, Chris Stewart. And then we will hear from a few members of the family. If you could please hold your questions, let them get through what they need to say. Thank you so much. As, as we prepare to pray, family of Jacob Blake is with us, and the family of Dante Wright is with us. This verdict and this sentencing is the longest sentence we've seen, but it is not justice, because George Floyd is in a grave tonight, even though Chauvin will be in jail. So let us not feel that we're here to celebrate because justice would have been George Floyd never have been killed. Justice would have been the maximum. We got more than we thought only because we have been disappointed so many times before. 22 and a half years is longer than we've ever got, but shorter than what we should have gotten in the past. Let us remember, a man lost his life. This is not a prayer of celebration. It's a prayer to thank God for giving the strength of this family and those activists that stayed in the streets to make sure this court had to do what was right. Let me repeat for those in the back, because those are the ones that marched, <laughs> that this is the longest sentence they've ever given but it is not justice. Justice is George Floyd would be alive. Amen. Justice is that they would have been doing this. Had they done sentences like this before, maybe Chauvin would not have thought he would have gotten away with it. Right. Yeah. So let us remember the people that you castigated and attacked that marched in Minneapolis and that we marched all over this country 
that wouldn't stop. And we're not going to stop. One sentence does not solve a criminal justice problem. The United States Senate must show the same courage this jury showed and hold police accountable for murder and make them pay in the court of law maximum for murder. Not a token, not a donation, but full accountability Amen. for the actions that you did. Let us pray. Dear God, we come to the same spot we bowed at the beginning of the trial, asking you to give this family strength and give them grace. And you brought us now to the end of this particular proceeding. They will say it is more time than any time in history, but we will say that history has been long underserving its citizens. Yes. And we humbly thank you for giving this family the strength to stand where other families didn't even get a court date. Yes. We remember yes. Eric Garner today. Yes. We remember Michael Brown. Yes. We remember Jacob Blake, yes. who is still with us. We remember Tamir Rice on his birthday. 19 years old would have been today. We remember Breonna Taylor. Yes. They never got a court date. Never. We did get a court date, a conviction, and some time. Amen. Some will say that's progress. I will say, as Malcolm X said, if you have a mm. knife in my back six inches, mm. to take out four inches is progress, but I still have two inches of knife in my back. Mm. The uh -huh. knife is still in our back as long as these unresolved cases are there. And the Floyd family yes. and those of us in the civil rights community and the activist community will not stop until justice becomes a matter of federal law and no longer a news story, but the story that we know will follow. Touch the U.S. Senate to see that they must make law so that yeah. we will not have little children like George's daughter mm. had to give a judge a statement about the value of a daddy, mm. but they understand that all of your children matter. Yes, black lives matter, because you made us all. And we'll be careful to be loyal, and we'll be careful to live up to the calling you've placed on the lives of those that serve, and careful to give your name the praise. These blessings we ask in your name. Amen. Amen. Let me uh, bring on now, it's been a long journey, and this is not the end. This is just one stop on the highway toward full justice. None has been more courageous. None has been more consistent. One has not been more unselfish than the Attorney General of Black America, who has stood with this family from day one, came even when the cameras weren't there, and has stayed with the family and other families. Let us bring, before we bring members of the family, Attorney Ben Crump. Thank you. Thank you very much, Reverend Al Sharpton, for leading this family and this country in prayer as we continue to struggle to make the words of liberty and justice for all real in America. I stand here with a great legal team standing firmly with the family of George Floyd. That is attorney Chris Stewart and attorney Justin Miller from Atlanta, Georgia, attorney Tony Ramanucci from Chicago, Illinois, and attorney Jeff Storms from right here in Minneapolis. And at present, we have the brothers of George Floyd, Felonis Floyd, Terrence Floyd, and Rodney Floyd, as well as Brandon Williams. We have his cousins, Sharita Tate and Tara Brown. And we know at home praying, we have his sisters, uh, Bridget Floyd, Jaja Floyd, and Latanya Floyd, and certainly his beautiful daughter, Chris tells me, is looking, smiling, saying that her daddy changed the world, and he will talk more about that later. 
uh, and we want to acknowledge all his family. We want to acknowledge all of the people who use their voice to say his name. Say his name. Say his name. Say his name. Today represents an opportunity to be a turning point in America. This is the longest sentence that a police officer has ever been sentenced to in the history of the state of Minnesota. But this should not be the exception when a black person is killed by brutality by police. It should be the norm. And so when we think about real justice, real justice would be Silky, that George Floyd would still be here with his family. Right, right. Mm -hmm. So what we got today was some measure of accountability. And we understand that there are still federal charges pending. So as his brothers and his family ask for the maximum, we're still holding out for the maximum. That's right. We have to remember real justice in America will be black men and black women and people of color will not have to fear being killed by the police just because the color of their skin. Right. Yeah. That would be real justice. Yeah. Right. So we thank most of all the millions of Americans yeah. who raised their voice. Yeah. You all raised their, your voices and because you raised your voices, that is why we got the guilty conviction, and that is why we got the longest sentence in the state of Minnesota history. So on behalf of the Floyd family, we want to say thank you to millions of Americans who all said, until we get justice for George Floyd, until we get accountability for George Floyd, none of us can breathe. We can breathe just a little easier today, and we thank you for that. We, we back. Thank you all. And I will say this. We got accountability on the civil side, thanks to the leadership of the city leaders in Minnesota. We now have gotten some accountability in the criminal level. But we need accountability on the policy level. So we say to the United States Senate, pass the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act immediately, immediately, immediately. At this time, I give you one of the finest attorneys in the United States of America. I have had the pleasure of being with a team of lawyers, Reverend Al, who are second to none. And each of them work tirelessly day and night from every corner of America, working on behalf of George Floyd's family. And there is no way we could get to this point where we are on this journey to justice without all our brothers and sisters Bavani Ravindran, uh, Madeline Simmons, uh, Michelle Godot, all of those, Scott Peters, uh, all of them who are working, Scott Madison, they allowed us to come out front to be with the family today, but they are not forgotten. And I know my brother in the bar who just did wonderful things in Louisiana with Alton Sterling, Chris Stewart, appreciates each and every one of the lawyers on our team. At this time, you're gonna hear from attorney Chris Stewart and attorney Justin Miller. Uh, first, let me start by saying uh, Roxy and Gianna couldn't be here, but right now, uh, Gianna is actually watching. She's watching live. Um, so let me tell you, Gianna, you've done two things in this case. You started by saying, my daddy changed the world. Yep. I want you to know you changed the world. Because today, that statement that you gave was not just powerful, but it was prophetic. You told us that his spirit is still here. That's right. 
and people that are doubting, people that are looking at these monuments coming up and the statutes coming up of George Floyd and not understanding, you aren't understanding that his spirit is changing things. It doesn't matter who the man was. It matters who he is now. There are conversations happening between black and white that never would have happened before about policing. There are conversations happening between senators that we are pushing and urging to stand up for what you believe in. If you believe in law and order and change, then you will pass this bill because it protects everyone. Nelson Mandela once said, if you change what you believe, depending on who you're talking to, you are not fit to lead. That's right. Amen. That's right. So we are looking for leadership. We are looking for the spirit of George Floyd, which is in every single person now. We are getting off the sidelines and realizing that if you critique policing, it doesn't mean you hate every cop. It means you want the bad cops gone. And we only will change things by leaving the sidelines and coming together in the middle, no matter what color you are. And that is the spirit of George Floyd. And yes, Gianna has changed the world. It's been an honor and a privilege standing up for this family. Um, it's just been an honor. First and foremost, I would like to say to the family, my condolences, my, my prayers from my family and from everyone in Atlanta, from Scott Masterson, Madeline Simmons, uh, Lewis Brisboy Law Firm, who put in a lot of work to help get us to the point we are today. Thank you to the family. I know that uh, Mr. Chauvin's mother didn't have any words for the family, but, but we do, and I know you guys do. So, so, so to the family, I say my condolences, and I'm sorry, and we love you, and we love you. Because this is what it's about, first and foremost, love. Second thing I'll say is this. Until things like this are not national news, we haven't made it. We're still in the same place that we were 20 years ago and 30 years ago. We are all here talking about something that everybody sitting right here knew what should have happened. We knew from day one he murdered George Floyd. We all saw it. But we had to go through this for a year to get to this point where this family can have some modicum, some amount of closure, a year. So I'll say this, until black and brown people in this country can get closure, can depend on the justice system, can know that when someone murders somebody in broad daylight that they're going to be held accountable, we got a lot of work to do. And I will say to all you people, all you activists, all you people who are fighting from day one, keep working, keep pushing, Keep fighting, keep fighting, because we have a lot of work to do in Atlanta, Georgia, and, and, and in Brookline, Minnesota, Brooklyn Center, Minnesota, I'm sorry, and in New York City, and in Kenosha, Wisconsin, and in North Carolina, and in Los Angeles, California, in Texas, in Chicago, we have work to do. So keep pushing. This is a victory, and we're gonna celebrate it as a victory. But it's one small step, and we have a lot more to go. More to go. So thank you guys for being with us through all of this. Thank you guys for loving this family, and pass the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act ASAP. ASAP. Amen. And now, before we get to the family, some great lawyers uh, from Chicago, Illinois, one of the best civil rights lawyers in America. Uh, and a great lawyer who hails right here in Minnesota. I mean, without him uh, giving us the lay of the land, there is no way we would have been able to achieve what we have accomplished. Attorney Antonio Ramanucci and Attorney Jeff Storms. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tony Romanucci. What we saw today was the final, the graph intersected. Okay. The perfect apex now between civil justice and criminal justice. What we now have today, we have proof that black lives matter, that they are valuable, and that when you violate policies, you're going to pay, and you're going to pay a lot of money, and when you violate the law, you're gonna get prosecuted, mm -hmm. and you're gonna go to jail and you're gonna to go to jail for a long time. And those two lines cross today, and George Floyd now equals justice on both civil and criminal. Mm. But the job isn't over. It's not over until we go state to state. Reverend Al, Ben, 
You all said it so eloquently. We must have the George Floyd police reforming bill passed. Amen. If that doesn't get passed, our justice could fall. The graph could fall. We need justice all over America. We want justice for George Floyd, the Floyd family. We continue to love you. We always will. We'll always be a part of your lives. But there are so many other families that are here today that are also suffering and require that same justice, civil and criminal. That's what matters most. Thank you all. Thank you, Tony. Thank you. Thank you. I, not a lot to say that hasn't been said, but as the local Minnesota lawyer, I just want us to remember that we need all of you. We need the media, we need the activists, because the second we turn around and leave, we have to go back and ask ourselves, how do we get more justice for George Floyd? How do we get justice for Dante Wright? Mm. Yeah. How do we get justice for Winston Smith? Yeah. How do we get justice for the many families here who are regularly fought for on behalf by people like Tashira Garraway and her group, yeah. Nakima Levy Armstrong and her group? Nakima. And without all of you, we don't have the energy for that fight right here. We need you all to keep turning out and we appreciate it because it's allowed the Floyd family to get the most historic justice we've ever seen, but it's not enough. Amen. Thank you. Not enough. Don't forget Bilal Eid. Bilal Eid. And as we get ready to bring up the Floyd family, I would be remiss if Brandon, as we heard the Senate's uh, leaned in and whispered in my ear, I got a text from Brianna Taylor's mother congratulating us on getting some justice, the justice that she never got. That's right. And I have to tell you, Reverend Al, as Derek Chauvin's mother was standing up there making her comments, I thought of Tamika Palmer, this Brianna Taylor's mother. Yes. And so it's not enough until we get justice for all of our people who have been killed unjustly. I, I think yeah, Brianna Taylor is with us. Yeah. Uh, right now, we're going to have you hear from some of the Floyd family members. Uh, you've come to know him. He has been speaking at the U.S. Congress, uh, to the United Nations and everywhere, saying that we demand justice for my big brother George Floyd. He sounds like a politician, Reverend Al. Uh, Mr. Falonis Floyd. Keep fighting. Keep going. Uh, I got a, a, a lot of emotions going through my head right now, but uh, I just find it uh, profound that I felt that I begged for justice for my brother, some type of accountability. The treatment that I thought that everybody should receive, it's just life, you know. You can't get that back. We all live together in this world, and we all want to be able to work together in this world. You have good police officers and you have bad ones. The fact that you shouldn't have to sort them out. Mm. The community that I grew up in, it was a lot of African-American people. But the fact that Minnesota has a, a greater amount of Caucasian people, I still think that everybody should be the same. Everybody should be neutral. Everybody should want to make a difference and make sure that people, when they come to Minnesota, they don't think about George Floyd. They should be able to think about how great Minnesota is, mm. right. not thinking about Philando Castile, you know, his, his mother is Dante. still fighting. Yes. Thinking about Dante Wright. Yes. Many families I had to console. You think about Anthony McClain, mm -hmm. he was killed. All of these people were shot in the back, most of them. Yeah. The fact that I'm here and I'm still standing, and over a year later, I'm still speaking and I'm speaking out. Times are hard. 
I have a family. We wake up every day and we don't see my brother. Empty seats all around the house he would have been in. The fact that Gianna would grow up knowing that her father had made a difference in the world, but the fact that she cannot have a sweet 16. She cannot have him walk her down the aisle. Mm. She would not be able to have prom with the daddy dance. This is not something realistic. This is something, it's like a dream, but we all need to stand up for what is right. right. All right. All these activists and all these advocates, I thank you all. Definitely I thank you all. Because if you all didn't speak out, we wouldn't have had a lot of help. But the fact that the world, you got to think about Japan, you have to think about Germany, you have to thank United Nations, you have to thank uh, Italy. I have so many different people. I spoke to Africa all around the world, and they all think the same way. Your skin color should not define who you are. Amen. It should never be a weapon. And the fact that we're here standing today, still breathing, we're still fighting. Reverend Al always said, keep fighting. Keep fighting. And that's something I can't stop. I want to tell Miss Carr, I love you. Yeah. I know it's hard. That's Eric Garner's mom. That's right. I want to tell Breonna Taylor, mom, I love you. Pamela Turner. Pamela Turner. I know it's hard. I want to tell Pamela Turner, that's Baytown, Texas. Yeah. This, is, this is not OK. Her daughter is walking around. And I know she's in tears every day thinking about her mother. Her mother was killed in point blank range, shot multiple times. So many different people all around the world who didn't even have this type of technology. I just want to reiterate, not just black lives matter, all lives matter. We need to stand up and fight. Can't get comfortable. Because when you get comfortable, people forget about you. Amen. So the legend will still live on. George is not here, but the spirit lives here. Breonna Taylor is not here, but the spirit still lives here. Eric Garner is not here, spirit still right here. But the fact that we're here fighting, I want all you all to stand up and fight. Thank you all so much. And next we're going to have another brother of George who came all the way from New York. Brooklyn. Brooklyn, New York. In the house. And as we introduce him, it's not lost on us as uh, Attorney Stewart and Attorney Ramanuja and I taught. It's always a journey to justice. Tony told me Laquan McDonough, who was found killed, his killer, the police officer that killed him, shot him 14 times in the back mm. on video. 16 times in the back on video and he was convicted of second degree murder and he was only sentenced to six years. Botham Joan, who in Dallas, Texas, was killed in his own apartment. Right. The white police woman Amber Geiger was found guilty of first degree murder, Reverend Al. That's right. And she was only sentenced to 10 years. And Justin Miller, I, where was it, uh, Walter Scott in South Carolina? Shot Same conviction, shot in the back, on video, convicted 20 years. So each step, each case, we keep making progress. We came too far to stop now. We have to keep going forward. And so that's why all the energy we have in this courtroom, we have to take the Capitol Hill and we have to join Senator Cory Booker. We have to join Congresswoman Karen Bass, Senator Tim Scott. We got to say, you all, we need meaningful police reform that's right. so we don't have to put up with these injustices. Seem like Reverend Al, every other week, there's a new hashtag. We can stop this, America. We're at the turning point. Terrence, Floyd, Brooklyn, New York. Let me hear y'all say change. 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 Let me hear y'all say change. Change. That's right. Just like I heard y'all say change all together, that's how we're going to keep the change going together. Fight. Keep fighting. The way we got here is because of 
our fight and your fight together. Y'all hit the streets. We thankful for y'all. And, and, and we just, we just, I'm, I'm overwhelmed. I'm overwhelmed. Cause I'm gonna tell you a quick story. I had a dream the other night. I was um, in a field. I was in a field in, in the South I, with, my, with my family. And I saw, I looked back and I saw a man. I saw a man coming up, walking, walking. And I'm trying to figure out who is that, who is that? I look, I look, I, he gets closer. And all of a sudden I see the hat cocked to the side like this. Anybody that know me know who that is. That's my father. So he got close to me and he gave me a smile and he gave me a hug. I woke up, that, that dream was so real, I woke up hugging myself. Mm. So I knew, I was a little leery about the, about the citizen, but because of that, I knew that my father was saying, you good, he's good. Keep doing what you're doing for me, for your brother, for your name. Mm. Because we Floyd strong and we gonna stay strong. Thank you. Well said. Thank you, Terrence. Uh, next, we will hear from uh, the nephew of George Floyd, who's like a brother, uh, like a son in many regards to him, Brandon Williams. No. Uh, it's funny that we got justice, but not enough justice. You know. I remember standing here the first day of trial in this very same spot. And we were very optimistic and unsure of what was gonna happen. After seeing that video, we should have been 100% sure that we would be at a guilty conviction with a maximum sentence. When you think about George being murdered in cold blood with a knee on his neck for nine minutes and 29 seconds, execution style and broad daylight, 22 and a half years is not enough. We were served a life sentence. We can't get George back. Gianna can't hug George again. He'll be able to hug his family possibly and see his family again. We can't get George back. Mm. So in retrospect, I feel that he should have received a life sentence as well. Right. Mm. What kind of message are you sending to our country? What kind of message are you sending to the younger kids like Gianna? That you can kill a man in cold blood and get a slap on the wrist? That's like a slap in the face to all of us standing up here. And everybody around the world who feel what we feel and saw that video. So I won't celebrate this. I won't celebrate it at all. But I will celebrate a guilty conviction on a police officer that killed a black man. Because far too many times we see them kill us and get right away with it. I will celebrate this as a victory for Ms. Tamika Palmer, who I'm very, very close with. Yeah. I hope that attorney Daniel Cameron out in Kentucky mm -hmm. can follow Keith Ellison's lead mm -hmm. and charge the cops who killed Breonna Taylor. Yeah. So there are some positive things to take from this, but this 22 and a half years just isn't one for me. Thank you. All right, All right Brandon. From the heart, Brandon. Uh, and we have his brother, his baby brother, Rodney Floyd from Houston, Texas, Third Ward. Hey, how y'all doing? You know, I would like to thank the protesters first, the local protesters. And uh, in this city, I would like to thank all the protesters that came out across the country to this city and standing up in their cities as well, demanding change. We all have one thing in common. We want change for my brother's case. This right here is this 22 year sentence they gave this man. It's a slap on the wrist. We serving a life sentence and not having them in our life. And that hurts me to death. And looking at his daughter, beautiful daughter Gianna in her video, saying the very first video of my dad changed the world. He did change the world. But at the end result, he gets a slap on the wrist. My nephew just said, 22 years from killing her dad, that she can't take her to the school. He can't eat lunch with her. He can't conversate with her. I know with my daughter, I love my daughter. Hugs her, we talk, that's my little best friend. And I hate to see that he cannot have that, she can't have that connection with her father. Those great conversations, those wonderful phone calls, lighting up her face, you know? 
and around the world, black, white, brown, we all need to come together, take our bus to the Senate, stand out there, and demand this George Floyd Act be passed, and also, as well as the act being passed, pass. We need to stand there, put pressure on this Senate. That's right. You know, and I, I, I was That's thinking right. last night, guys, honestly, we heard Obama say this plenty of times, get out and vote. We hear so many folks say get out and vote. Everybody got out and voted and marched in these streets, and we got changed. We got our, our first black president. A lot of people came together like they did now. My brother's deaf, and we got this. But guess what, people? We need to take that same energy and bring that back to the Senate and demand them pass that bill. Amen. Because as we've seen, we've seen Trump numerous times stand up, fuss, fussing on camera numerous times, countless times, because he did not have the power that we thought he had to get something done. He had to call on the Senate. And we need to get out there and understand that message. Go to the Senate, put press on the Senate, and get Amen. these bills and laws passed for all of us. Amen. Can stand on them with this American flag as one, and we as black people need to know this American flag represents us because we feel it don't. All right, all right. Uh, you thank you, Rodney. Thank you, thank you. And as we uh, bring his cousin Sharita, yeah, please understand, this is only one step in getting accountability in the criminal level. The federal charges are still pending. So I do believe that when Felonis and Terrence and Rodney say the maximum, it is still attainable to get maximum accountability for George Floyd. 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 Now you will hear from his cousin, Sharita Tate. Come on, Sharita. Hello, everybody. Uh, I won't spend a whole lot of time sort of reiterating what my family has already said. I think they have spoke very eloquently about how we've dealt with this last year and our thought processes as it relates to the amount of time that Derek Chauvin was given. Truth be told, um, I don't think any sentence would be enough because what truly would be justice for would be for us to be able to have George back. Uh, but with that being said, I'd just like to take this time to thank the countless number of people that have been supportive of us since the very beginning. Uh, I remember when we uh, first came here and we were talking about, uh, you know, the sentence and, and uh, the trial and, and what we potentially the outcome would be. And as we sat through the trial and watched the murder over and over again and came back with, with the three convictions, then we uh, all waited and waited for this day. I will have to say that um, we didn't get what we wanted. We definitely wanted to see uh, the maximum penalty, but however, as they've already stated, we do have the federal ahead of us, and we are hoping that we can uh, get some real accountability with him getting a life sentence. Um, and lastly, I just want to speak on the, the policing act. You know, we've had it uh, partially, it's before the Senate, and I would just say, what echo what everyone else has said, we need this passed immediately. We need to really have some true accountability across the board. Thank you. And, and finally, before we uh, take a few of your questions, we have his cousin Tara Brown from Houston, Texas. Okay. Oh, well, I just want to say, um, you know, my family has spoken a lot about uh, everything that we, we've gone through since we started this journey. Um, and I will tell you, it definitely has been uh, a journey for us. And as a family, we decided that uh, we were committed to two things for sure. We wanted to make sure that we got some measure of justice uh, for, for George and for the countless other families who have lost loved ones in the way that we did. Um, and the other thing is that we were committed to making sure that we force the change that we want to see and create this legacy that will live on forever. Just want to say thank you to everybody who has supported us throughout this journey, especially the protesters and the activists who have been 
nonstop and relentless and, and they've helped us get to this point. Um, and the other thing is we want to say that this bill needs to get passed and I want to make sure that we don't stop just with this bill, but it's important that you hold your state um, elected officials accountable to that as well. We are also looking at the local level where they're making change, even in our city where we're from in Houston. There has been um, some changes already. Our, our mayor, Sylvester Turner, has you know, banned chokehold and, and you know, we have um, qualified, qualified immunity is on the table. So we are keeping active and we want to make sure that you stay in the fight. Please keep fighting. Thank you. Thank you, Tara. And finally, our national leader, Reverend Al Sharpton. We're going to open up the questions for the family and all of us. Let me say this so you're clear. If there is conviction in the federal trial and he is convicted and the other three, that federal time can run after the 22 and a half years. Amen. It does not have to run concurrent, which is why we're saying that we still want full justice. Right. Secondly, when we talk about the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, we know the difference, Senate, between two slices of bread and a sandwich. Mm. A sandwich has meat between right. the two right. slices right. of bread. Right. Don't come down with a compromise that is two slices of bread with no meat in the middle. Don't put George Floyd's name, a strong man, on a weak bill. Make sure that you talk to those in the family and those of us involved in this struggle before you make any compromise. The difference between a compromise and a sellout mm. is in the eye of the appraiser. Wow. And we will be part of the appraisal. <laughs> Questions? Yes, yeah, a I have a question with regard to the family, yes, and I'd like to pose a question to one of the family members, whomever would like okay. to answer it. Okay. What's the question? Okay. News conference in June last June. Attorney General Ellison um, issued a clarion call to the arts and entertainment community to take the mantle in seeking justice. Any one of the family members can answer why that might be important to them or why it may not. Why, why to get entertain, uh, artists and entertainers of art? We, uh, Felonis will attempt to answer your question, but we want to invite other families who are here who have lost loved ones uh, due to police brutality to also come forward. Uh, Mr. Floyd, can you answer that question? Yeah, entertainers. Um, Ellison called entertainers to uh, stand um, okay. and be a catalyst. Okay. For this. I mean, just tell me you shouldn't have that. We, we may answer that question on the side yeah, for you. Okay. Uh, okay, question about the case. And, and uh, Attorney Stiles, where are the other families? Today in court, Derek Chauvin offered condolences to the family. I was wondering what you thought about that. And also Derek Chauvin's mother continued to say that her son was innocent and that people did not know his actions spoke so loud, I didn't need to hear his words. I was wondering what you thought about those comments. Condolences from Derek Chauvin. Yeah, and the other families, they got to turn it over to you. And people did not know Derek Chauvin like her family. All right. I just thought about it as the same thing with my brother. Uh, people didn't know who my brother was. Uh, they, they labeled him. The trial was all about my brother. Instead, it, it should have been about Mr. Chauvin. So. The things that she spoke about, I understand that because that's her son. Same way she spoke up for her son, I spoke up for my brother. So we all we all love our loved ones, but the fact that I will never see my brother again is it's worse because she still will have the opportunity to see her son in the cell anytime she wants to. That's right. Let let me say something about that with Felonis. When I heard his mother speak, and I respect any mother stand up for their son, mm -hmm. but it reminded me, and I said it in the eulogy right here, mm -hmm. that George called for his mother. Mm -hmm. And the one that seemed not to understand the bond between a mother and son, when a son would call for his mother that was no longer alive, was not the Floyd family, 
it was her son, Derek, mm. because that did not make him stop when he heard a man call for his mother. I respect his mother. He did not respect George calling for his mother. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Rev. We, we are, want to acknowledge Bishop Harding, yeah. who was over the Salvation Army where George worked, right and uh, George did so much great. So let's acknowledge and give him a round of applause for the great work they do. Now we're going to turn it over to a lady who needs no introduction at all. here in Minneapolis, Minnesota. At all. She's a lawyer, she's an activist, and she's a freedom fighter. Y'all give it up for my sister, Nakima. Yeah. yeah. yeah she's going to introduce some other families. Yeah. Please, Queen. Good afternoon. It's, it's our honor to stand here with the family of George Floyd and the lawyers who continue to represent yeah. this family in their continued pursuit of justice. This is one step towards progress, but this is not justice and this is not full accountability right. as the family has asked for. I'm Nakima Levy Armstrong. I'm a civil rights attorney based here in Minneapolis. And I'm standing next to Tashira Garraway, who is part of Family Supporting Families Against Police Violence, Jaylani Hussein from CARE Minnesota, and Michelle Gross from Communities United Against Police Brutality. And we are all here as people who stand on the front lines with the folks who are here from the Twin Cities who hold it down time and time again. We gotta give it up yeah. for the, the activists and the organizers the who face rubber bullets, tear gas, right. arrests, and demonization right. for standing up for George Floyd and all stolen lives. This incident today of Derek Chauvin being sentenced is something that we've been waiting for for a long time. The sad part about his sentence is that we know that black men often receive more time for doing less than what Derek Chauvin did. There are plenty of black men and Latino men in prison for nonviolent drug offenses. But here we have a veteran officer who was literally able to lynch someone in broad daylight in the presence of children and other witnesses and essentially get a proverbial slap on the wrist. That is not acceptable. Judge Cahill should have held him accountable to the fullest extent of the law. It is not enough that he has received the most time from a co a compared to other police officers who have killed people. This is a new day. It's not based on what they did in the past when they could lynch us and get away with it, when they could brutalize us and get away with it, when they could kill people and get away with it. Just because it's the most time does not mean that it is enough time. So we will continue to stand up and fight alongside this family and everyone else who cares about justice in demanding that the federal government now step in and hold Derek Chauvin and those other three police officers who were involved in killing George Floyd accountable to the fullest extent of the law. If the federal government had stepped in a long time ago, George Floyd might still be alive today. So that is the least that they can do in this situation. And I wanna encourage all the activists, the organizers, the community members who are sitting at home to get off the couch and come down to the government center to stand in solidarity with families supporting families and other organizing groups, as well as a nine o'clock nighttime peaceful demonstration that's gonna happen downtown. Thank you all for being here. Realize we're not sleeping in the Twin Cities and we're gonna to continue to stand up and fight for justice. Thank you. My name is Tashira Garraway. I am the founder of Family Supporting Families Against Police Violence. I am also the mother of Justin Tigan's 14 year or 15 year old son who was brutally beat to death by the St. Paul police and thrown inside of a trash dumpster August 19, 2009. I stand here in solidarity with Emma Till's family. Um, Travis Jordan family, Brian Quinonez family, uh, Demetrius Hill, Jeffrey Smith, and so many other family, Kobe Heisler, 
um, Derek, uh, Jacob Blake's family, um, so many other families that have led up to George Floyd and that have lost loved ones after George Floyd. I want the world to know that there is a group of families that are fighting together, that is standing up That's for right. justice, right. that is standing up in solidarity. Right. And we ask that those voices be paid attention to. We ask that those voices that you do not hear about, those stories that have been swept under the rug, that people have not heard, we ask that you hear those voices. Because they were not successful with covering up George Floyd's murder does not mean that the rest of the murders are not just as important. The rest of the lives are just as important, and we want everyone to hear from those families. So I stand here to fight for those families. We will not back down. We will not be quiet in this time, but we are holding up the rest of the families that have taken the same loss as George Floyd family. We we thank we, we are very thankful for the little bit of crumbs that they did give us today uh, with holding this officer accountable. But just like George Floyd is the face of hundreds of murders around Minnesota that have been covered up, so is George, so is Derek Chauvin the face of hundreds of killer cops that are still out here walking around in our communities on the forces still serving. They have brutalized family members, they have brutalized the community, and we we need these officers held accountable just like they held Derek Chauvin accountable today. We need the rest of these officers held accountable as well. And we cannot be quiet about that and not hold them accountable like we held Derek Chauvin accountable. Thank you. We also, we have Courtney Ross, the girlfriend of uh, George Floyd here today as well, standing in solidarity with the rest of our families as well. Thank you. Come on, Brother Blake. My name is Jacob Blake. Blake. The verdict was handed down today, and we have no choice but to accept it. We don't have to be happy with it, but we accept it. Is it enough? No. But will we accept it? We must. We must say Bismillah. Uh, no, I'm just, I came barely here. I just made it about 15 minutes. Okay, yeah, but yeah. You, you still, I guess, have to look at your, your face. 